case study called Transformation of an Indication. My disclaimer. So the word transformation is defined as a dramatic change in format or appearance. When I say the word transformation, I bet most of you think of the metamorphosis of a butterfly. However, if you are a Marvel comic fan, when I say the word transformation, you may think of Dr. Bruce Banner transforming into the Hulk. Either way, I think we're all on the same page about what transformation means. So in discussing transformation of an indication, um, I think most of you probably can attest to the fact that during an NDA BLA review, FDA may make just a few minor comments to labeling. We make a huge significant amount of comments in which, form we, in, in which case we actually transform the labeling into something else. So for purposes of this presentation, we're going to focus on the indications and usage section. We're also going to bring up other sections of labeling and present an extreme example of transformation of a fictitious labeling. And this, there's no way this labeling or this drug could possibly exist because I have so many different labeling caveats in here. So please realize that this is, could never be a true drug. Um, but I think it's useful for providing labeling examples. So the objectives of this presentation, um, using a labeling case study, we're going to show how labeling regulations and guidances can be implemented in developing and reviewing the indications and usage section, and other sections as well. Thus far, you've heard some great presentations about various sections of labeling. The focus of my presentation is to describe how to maybe apply those principles in developing labeling. We're also going to discuss how drug safety and efficacy information is appropriately distributed in sections of labeling. Again, with a focus on the indications and usage section, what type of information might be applicable to this section versus other sections? and ultimately how the overall message or what we're trying to communicate helps best determine the location of the information. So I think we all can probably understand this, most of us in labeling, that sorting the safe and effective use information into various sections of labeling for a particular drug can be very challenging. And when I thought of an analogy to this, I thought about proper trash disposal. Not at all thinking that our labeling is related to trash at all, however, at all. But when I see something like this, and I've seen this at the airport, I sometimes get confused of how to dispose of my trash. So the other day, for instance, I had a half-eaten sandwich that was attached to paper that was in a plastic container. And I threw the plastic container out, but I'm trying to separate the sandwich from the paper to make sure I put the paper in proper disposal being a good steward of recycling, and couldn't do it and got very frustrated. But um, the good news for us from a labeling perspective is we do have some guidance, unlike proper trash disposal. We have regulations and guidances that do inform us about which buckets of labeling sections information's, information belongs. The other inf important information and difference between proper trash disposal and labeling is that when you dispose of your trash, you just have a choice of one bucket. You just don't can't put that trash in separate buckets. But from labeling perspective, it's important to consider that a specific type of topic of information may be pertinent to more than one section of labeling. Um, and ultimately, how we communicate that information will dictate which sections of labeling that goes into. Um, when we train labeling, uh, the first thing I often tell my reviewers is it's important to understand how prescribers, our end users, under, use our labeling. They don't read our labeling like a book from top to bottom. Instead, they pull out the information and the section that they're most interested in at the time. So if they want to find out about a drug interaction for a drug, they're going to look in the drug interaction section. That's why it's really critical that that section be a standalone section of critical information about drug interactions, as well as include specific cross-references for additional content. So for instance, I saw a drug label the other day that had contraindications for a drug interaction. However, there's no drug interactions section. So a prescriber may miss looking at the contraindications section, may be looking for that drug interaction section, and would never know that there are drug interactions. So that's why it's, I think it's important to consider these buckets and how we sort the information out. Similarly, when we review labeling, we don't do, use a top-to-bottom book type approach. We start, I think Eric mentioned, with the sections that are pertinent to data, 
which is clinical pharmacology and clinical studies, for instance, and use the basis of the data to inform clinical recommendations that will be appropriately distributed in the other sections of labeling. So um, Iris uh, discussed the indications and usage section. I'm just going to reiterate some of the key points for our case study today. So based on the regulations, uh, the indications and usage sections must state that the drug is indicated for the treatment, prevention, mitigation, cure, or diagnosis of a recognized disease or condition, or of a manifestation of a recognized disease or condition, or for the relief of symptoms associated with a recognized disease or condition. So it's important that indications start with is indicated for. That's not usually such a problem with new product labeling. However, we see old non-PLR product labeling, we're trans uh, converting it to PLR. Some of that old product labeling will have verbiage such as drug X is used for, not indicated for. So we want the actually indication to state is indicated for. Another thing that's important is the terminology needs to be scientifically accurate and clinically relevant. Um, and so that's very important for, let's say, a novel indication, maybe first time this indication's ever been um, utilized. That's really important to discuss with the review division early on in clinical development, not probably the time the NDA BLA is submitted, but early on to ensure that the terminology and the indication is scientifically accurate and meaningful. Another thing is the um, regulations use these terms that are used in indication, treatment, prevention, mitigation, et cetera. But there may be cases with, where other terminology may be appropriate. For instance, indicated for the management of, decrease the risk of, decrease the incidence of. So I think that it's important, again, to work with the review division to de describe, to define what's best for your indication and your drug specifically. So now let's go to our uh, case study. This is an indications and usage section for a new molecular entity. We're going to call it drug X. So drug X is going to be used for the proprietary name and drug oxide for the non-proprietary name. This is what the applicant has proposed. Drug X is indicated for the treatment of patients with disease A. And in this case, the applicant has a limitation of use. The drug X should only be used with prednisone 5 milligrams orally twice daily. And another limitation of use, the drug X is not recommended in patients with severe hepatic impairment. So the first question we ask is, what is the indicated population? So to sort that out, we have to think about the fact that there are various subpopulations of patients with disease A who could be treated with uh, drug X, and that some of these subpopulations could very well overlap. And some of these subpopulations, which I've mentioned here on this list, and we're going to describe some of them, the important thing to think about is which of these subpopulations is appropriate for this drug, and which of these subpopulations must be described in indications of usage or may be best described in other sections of labeling. So key points in how to sort this out about subpopulations. Again, the first thing we turn to is our regulations and guidance is to give us direction about where to put information in labeling. So the key points about the indication is that it needs to include the appropriate level of detail about the population for whom the drug is indicated including, as we discussed earlier, the age group or the indicated population. Also, if the drug needs to be reserved for certain situations, such as um, refractory to a specific drug or only used in with another uh, therapy that's fa failed, or if the drug is used in conjunction with a primary mode of therapy, such as another drug or a diet exercise or something along those lines, or if specific tests are necessary for selecting and monitoring the patients who are using the drug such as EGRF testing or any other companion diagnostic. The regulations are also very clear about the evidentiary standard necessary to support an indication. So for drug products other than biologics, all indications must be supported by substantial evidence of effectiveness based on adequate well controlled studies. And for biologics, all indications must be supported by substantial evidence of effectiveness. So now that we have the framework of uh, what is in, how we just define or describe and de de um, ultimately just um, put in labeling the indicated population, the first place we're going to look is clinical studies. The reason being is because the clinical studies section must describe the clinical studies that facilitate an understanding of how to use the drug safely and effectively, essentially those adequate well controlled studies we just mentioned. So we, before we start anywhere, we start with section 14. 
And what happens is we tell our review team to look at the data in Section 14, look at the efficacy data, analyze it, make some conclusions, and let's just adequately describe that information in Section 14. And when we describe that information, it's very important that we don't imply or suggest an unapproved use. So this is what the Apple can propose for Section 14, clinical studies. So you'll notice the first sentence says the efficacy of drug X was evaluated in CANNED. In this case, CANNED is just a fictitious acronym for a study name. And as you've been see, probably have noticed in our recent drug approvals, we've been including the acronym of certain studies, most, uh, particularly those that prescribers are familiar with or show up in uh, literature because they're familiar with this, it's meaningful for them to include these acronyms. So you'll see these as the description of the study. Uh, you'll also see the NCT number included. Um, and this, again, is included so that prescribers can find out more detailed information about the study if they choose. Um, however, this only should appear in Section 14 and not other sections to avoid clutter and redundancy. So in this case, in the description of the study, you'll notice that um, the patient population was, were adult patients with disease A, so there were no pediatric patients in the study. All patients received 5 milligrams of prednisone twice daily for 24 weeks. And the efficacy analysis, you'll note that the, uh, it was stated that a statistically significant improvement in endpoint was observed in patients treated with drug X compared to those treated with placebo. So the way this is worded, it appears that drug X is acceptable treatment as monotherapy for the treatment of disease A even though prednisone was administered to all patients throughout the study. And this may or may not be appropriate. We actually have to turn again to our review team to see if, indeed, prednisone contributed to the efficacy of this product or, indeed, monotherapy with drug X is appropriate. So the review team reviews the data and makes uh, certain conclusions and decides that effectiveness is established in First off, adult patients with disease A. Again, pediatric patients were not omitted from the study. Um, and although the trial omitted geriatric patients, based on the uh, risk-benefit analysis, the review team concludes that adult patients is still the appropriate indicated population, and we don't need to exclude or omit geriatric patients from the indication. The review team also concludes in this case, again, this is fictitious and this could change based on the data, but in this case, they believe that prednisone did contribute to the e efficacy and combination um, use is appropriate and monotherapy is not appropriate. So then we have to go back to our clinical study section and we're going to revise it appropriately to make sure that it's clear that the product drug X is only indicated, was only, the efficacy analysis is only appropriate in patients with combination use with prednisone. So you see the first sentence here, we say the efficacy of drug X in combination with prednisone was added. And then the efficacy analysis will state that the statistically significant improvement in endpoint was observed in patients treated with drug X with prednisone compared with patients treated with placebo with prednisone. So now that we've revised our clinical study section and we've defined the efficacy population, we go back to our clinical study, our, I'm sorry, indications and usage section. And throughout this presentation, I'll keep going back to indications and usage and revising it based upon the additional data that we'll keep accumulating over time. So in this case, you can see that I added in combination with prednisone to the indication statement because based on regulations, if a product is approved for use only uh, in combination with another product, that must be part of the indication statement. We added the term adult. Again, the draft indications usage guidance recommends including age groups in indication statement. We've omitted or removed the statement about uh, that drug X should only be used with prednisone 5 milligrams twice daily because we added prednisone as part of the indication. And in addition, specific dosing recommendations are not generally included in indications and usage. So, Back to this point, this was discussed several times about other factors that may narrow or broaden indication. As Iris mentioned, um, the indicated population may mirror the efficacy population described in Section 14 or may, for, or may be more narrow or uh, more broad. We've already touched on the fact that geriatric patients were omitted from the clinical studies for drug X. However, we decide to um, indicate the product for all adult patients and not omit geriatric patients. Now we're going to turn to some other data outside of clinical studies that could also impact the indication. 
So pediatric use, um, and pediatric drug development is held to the same evidentiary standards as drug, adult drug uh, development. Safe and effective use uh, must be based on substantial evidence of effectiveness. However, there are instances in which um, extrapolation of adult efficacy data to p can be made to support a pediatric indication. Usually those are instances for severe diseases where the, uh, drug, the disease and the effect on the drug are expected to be similar in adult and pediatric patients. Um, and then in which case we often will have additional data such as pharmacokinetic and or safety data in pediatric patients to make this conclusion. Again, this is not the most common situation, but for labeling purposes, it makes it more interesting. So in this case, the review team has concluded that they're going to expand the indication for drug X in combination with prednisone to pediatric patients 12 years of age and older. So how does that look? So the first place we look for or describe that information is the pediatric use subsection. Again, we turned our regulations and guidances and pediatric use information should be described in section 8.4, pediatric use. And as Eric mentioned, what's important to include in this subsection is first the pediatric regulatory statement, which is um, which should be comparable to the indication statement. So the first statement saying that safety effectiveness of drug X in combination with prednisone for the treatment of disease A had been established in pediatric patients 12 years of age and older. So that sets the tone for who the approved population in pediatrics is. The next statement is very similar to what um, Eric mentioned, that when a pediatric use is based on um, adequate well-controlled studies in adults with additional pediatric um, data, that information must be described in labeling. So that second sentence just summarizes the data that support the pediatric use. The very last sentence, the safety and effectiveness of drug X have not been established in pediatric patients less than 12 years of age, is again a required pediatric use statement for, to, to support the fact that this drug is not indicated in patients 12 years of age and older. So um, I mentioned before about this self-standing uh, notion, and this is helpful to look for in this example because a, a prescriber who wants to find out pediatric use information can go to the pediatric use subsection, get a summary of the indicated population in pediatric subpopulation um, that the product has approved for, the subpopulation that the product is not approved for, the basis of approval, and also very importantly, appropriate cross-references to find out additional information. So back to our indication statement. Now that we've expanded our indication to pediatric patients 12 years of age and older, we're going to include that in the indication statement. So um, now we're going to tackle this limitation of use. Drug X is not recommended in patients with severe hepatic impairment. So uh, before we look into the data and figure out what support that information, where that information belongs, let's just reiterate the difference between an indication versus limitation of use. Again, some of this was already covered by IRIS, but some key points for consideration is a limitation of use usually is used to identify a particular patient population in which a drug should generally not be used. It differs from a contraindication, which is a situation in which the drug should not be used because the risk of use clearly outweighs any clinical benefit. It's presented separately from the indication. That's included when there's a reasonable concern or uncertainty about a drug's risk-benefit profile. An absence of data in a particular population subset is generally not um, uh, described as a limitation of use. So I'd like to think about in these buckets to sort out the information. For, so the thing, uh, types of information that would be more applicable to the actual indication is that information that narrows or further defines the drug's approved ind indication and used to identify patient populations which the drug should be used versus a limitation of use was a reasonable concern about the risk benefit of the product and typically describes a population outside the approved population and identifies a patient population which the drug should not be used. But then you have this other big bucket of other sections of labeling. And this is warnings and precaution, use in specific population. And this is going to be very much dictated by regulations and guidances. But this is also a very important bucket to keep in mind. 
So the first thing we think about when trying to understand the hepatic impairment um, information where it belongs is to first look with the, at the data. We'd always talk, like we did with clinical studies, we looked at the data. Here we're going to look at the clinical pharmacology data. And you're going to have an excellent presentation tomorrow about clinical pharmacology, but this is just a sm small snippet for purposes of this presentation. So in our example of drug X, the pharmacokinetic information is described based on regulations and guidances under the pharmacokinetics subsection, specific populations heading, patients with hepatic impairment subheading. And you'll see here that this, again, is a data section. It summarizes the data in patients with normal and moderate hepatic um, impairment and describes the increase in AUC for both populations. And there's also a statement that there's no pharmacokinetic data in patients with severe hepatic impairment. So the first thing, again, we turn to our review team. This is what the applicant proposed. Is this appropriate? We may tweak it, but at the end of the day, they agree that this is a summary of the data. Again, this is a data section, so we're not going to include any clinical recommendations. But based on this data, we're going to ask the review team, what are your recommendations for this data? What should we tell our prescribers? So the review team thinks about it, and they decide that in patients with moderate, mild or moderate hepatic impairment, they don't recommend a reduced dose of drug X. So patients with severe hepatic impairment, again, we don't have any data, but based on the data we have, do have in mild and moderate, benefit risk assessment, clinical considerations. There are several options. The team can consider contraindicating the product for use in patients with severe hepatic impairment. Um, they can consider stating that we just don't have any data and leave it at that without a specific recommendation. They can provide a recommendation such as avoid use or not recommended. So again, this is discussion with the review team and ultimately their conclusion in this particular uh, fictitious example is that the recommendation is drug X is not recommended. So they actually came out with the same recommendation that the applicant did. So the next question is, where should we describe this information? So again, we turn to our regulations and guidances, and they do tell the regulations do state that in cases where we have sufficient data for um, specific populations, that should be described as uh, subsections within the use of specific population section. So the team ultimately concludes that this information is best described in section 8 under the hepatic impairment subsection as opposed to limitation of use, which is what the applicant proposed. Now, in considering our um, uh, one-stop approach that this labeling should be, this section should be a standalone, subsection should be a standalone section so patients can, I mean prescribers can adequately access it and get all the useful information they need. Let's see what we've um, included in here. Well, first, we've summarized the clinical recommendation, which is to reduce the dose of drug X in mild or moderate hepatic impairment patients. Um, we've described or summarized the basis for that recommendation about the increased exposure. And then we've also included the recommendation that uh, drug X is not recommended for patients with severe hepatic impairment, and then summarized the rationale. It's because we have, and we have no data in these patients. So essentially, this is that standalone subsection that a prescriber looking for hepatic impairment has an understanding of what to do and where to go for additional information. So for instance, here we have a C dosage administration cross-reference, but we haven't included the actual um, reduced dose recommendations in this particular subsection. That's more pertinent to do dosage administration. In, in addition, clinical pharmacology, that is a cross-reference to more details about the study which the prescriber can find. So now that we've mentioned the dosage administration section, how do we um, just how do we uh, uh, revise that or and make it uh, comparable to what we've already talked about? Well, the dosage administration section must first describe the recommended dosage, um, and in this case, we have adult and pediatric patients, um, and the pediatric patients are 12 years and older. So, based on the regulations that Eric mentioned, um, this dosage administration must include dosage recommendations for pediatric patients. Now, in this particular case, the adult and pediatric patients have the same dose. Do we need to call out and just say the word adult and pediatric patients, 12 years and older, in the recommended um, dosage subsection? Not necessarily. Um, it's clear, but sometimes you can just say the recommended dosage is. 
Um, however, it is going to be very imp imperative to use the words adult and pediatric when there are different dosage recommendations for those populations, or there are different dosage recommendations for different subpopulations of pediatric patients. Um, so we can add, say, the recommended dose in combination with prednisone, five milligrams orally twice daily. And you can also see we've added a cross-reference here to the prednisone labeling. The reason we do that is so the prescriber knows that there's additional information they need to refer to, and because these products must be used in combination to um, adequately prescribe these products, they need to refer to that, that labeling as well. And here is the dosage and administration subsection recommended dosage in hepatic impairment. Uh, again, based on regulations, dosage recommendations based on um, subpopulations must be described in this labeling. And here you can see we've defined and described the mild hepatic impairment dosage recommendations, moderate hepatic impairment dosage recommendations, and included a statement that the use of drug X in patients with severe hepatic impairment is not recommended. Now, if you're a purist, you're saying, well, that's not really a dosage recommendation. The first two are. And that's true, but sometimes we will include the statement about the other, the missing population for clarity. So the reader doesn't think, okay, here's information about mild hepatic impairment, here's information about moderate hepatic impairment patients, what about severe? So sometimes the clarity will include this statement. Um, also, you can see that dosage administration, when we train for labeling, we also we call this the cookbook section in, in, um, frequently because in this section we define it's like a cookbook. You, and when you're making a, a cake, you use eggs, water, flour. This is what you do, but the why of what you do is usually not included in this section. So section two, bulleted form. This is what you do, and here we include the subset, the cross references to use in specific population which is going to show us the rationale for why this uh, dosage recommendation has come about. So back to our indications and usage subsection. Here we've removed this limitation of use because we've included this information in use in specific, specific populations like I mentioned. So now we're going to get a little more complex. Um, in which section of labeling should adverse reactions associated with unapproved uses be discussed? Adverse reactions, warnings and precautions, a limitation of use and indications and usage. So the applicant in this case has proposed a post-marketing experience subsection. Um, and the first thing you may uh, ask is, well, this is an enemy. How do you have a post-marketing experience subsection? As you know, based on the regulations, um, adverse reactions that are observed in any um, setting, even outside the United States, must be described in the labeling. So these are obviously observed probably maybe in an EU um, setting. Uh, so what we do in this case is, as you know, the Adverse Reactions Guidance has this verbiage that's um, state included in the beginning of 6.2 or whatever your postmarking experience subsection is that sets the tone for the description of the spontaneous reports by informing the reader that um, it's not always possible to reliably estimate a frequency of the adverse reactions or establish a cause or ex to ex drug exposure. But what we've done in this case is we've kind of tweaked that verbiage uh, in the bolded text to say the following adverse reactions have been identified during post-approval use of drug oxide outside the United States. So we've included that outside the United States so the, the reader is clear that it's not, this is an enemy, but these adverse reactions were observed elsewhere. Now, in this subsection, we'll commonly see adverse reactions described within body systems. And those body systems are most frequently going to be seen alphabetically, just so that the prescriber can readily find them. And listed alphabetically, you'll see the list of the adverse reactions that um, are particular to each, um, sub, um, each category. Now, what you may notice here is that this hepatobiliary abnormal liver enzymes, sulfur hepatitis, and acute liver failure when used to treat patients with disease B. But the problem is drug X is not indicated for treatment of disease B, where the indication proposed indication is disease A. And as you may recall, unapproved indications of uses must not be applied or suggested in other sections of labeling. So the question is, where is this information most applicable? Should it be described as a limitation of use? was reasonable concern about the safety of the product and the population outside of the approved population in which the drug should generally not be used? 
Or is it more appropriate for another section of labeling, such as adverse reactions or warnings or precautions? So again, the first thing, place we turn to is our regulations and guidances. And in this case, um, our regulations do state that FDA uh, may develop a warning and precaution uh, for a drug that's commonly prescribed and that can, for a specific condition that's unapproved. And if that use of that drug is associated with a significant adverse reaction or hazard. So in this case, the team decided that a warning and precaution was pertinent. And you can see we titled the warning and precaution of toxicity in patients with disease B because this wasn't obviously observed in patients with disease A, but only in disease B. So the warning and precaution would summarize the risk. And they would also include a statement that drug X is not indicated for or not, and not recommended for the treatment of disease B because we need to clarify when describing that adverse reaction that this is an unapproved use. So the question remains, we have a warning and precaution about this unapproved use. Do we need a limitation of use or not? Um, and so this is, again, we turn to our clinical folks, because in many cases, you'll just see a warning and precaution that is used to describe an a risk associated with unapproved use. In other cases, you'll see a limitation of use and a warning and precaution. And again, it's very much a clinical call based upon the condition that's, uh, for which the product's being used outside the approved indication. Uh, the risk, obviously, is, is imperative in considering this decision. But it's, 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 it's certainly something that's discussed internally. But for our labeling purposes, again, to try to make it more interesting, we're going to assume that um, a limitation of use has been um, deemed necessary. So here we add this limitation of use to our indications and usage statement section uh, that drug X is not indicated for and not recommended for the treatment of disease B. Hepatotoxicity has been observed when drug X is used to treat disease B. And we've added that cross-reference to warnings and precautions, which will describe um, the risk associated with disease B. We're not done yet. One more thing, which is that drug X will be approved under the accelerated approval pathway. So as you may recall, um, accelerated approval is one mechanism that X FDA uses to expedite approval of drugs that are used to treat serious and life-threatening conditions. And um, under accelerated approval, products are approved based on a surrogate endpoint that is expected to predict clinical benefit or a clinical, benef clinical endpoint that can be measured earlier than irreversible morbidity or mortality. So for the regulations for an indication for indications for an accelerated approval product is that typical to any other product, the indication State indication section must include the same basic information, such as the disease condition that the product is it will treat, prevent, mitigate, or cure, or diagnose. But in addition is this requirement to include a succinct description of the limitation of usefulness of the drug and any uncertainty about anticipated clinical benefits with reference to clinical studies for discussion of the available, benefit, of the available evidence. So the good news is we did publish a guidance this year, a final guidance on labeling for accelerated approval. Um, and the guidance provides specific recommendations of the type of information that goes in the indications and usage section for products approved under accelerated approval. The guidance discusses when clinical benefit has subsequently been verified, how that may affect the, um, the labeling overall. Um, and also, when FDA withdraws approval of indication, for a product that's been under approved, for, approved under accelerated approval. However, that labeling has other approved indications, and how do you, what do you do in that labeling in that case? So um, the guidance does provide an example of how accelerated approval language um, looks. I'm going to dissect this a little bit so you can understand and, um, some of the principles here. So the first sentence is typical to any other indication statement. Drug X is indicated for, state the, state the uh, specific indication. That's typical for a traditional approval or accelerated approval. The next statement is this indication is approved under accelerated approval. And what we understand is most prescribers who prescribe drugs that are approved under accelerated approval are familiar with the term and know what it means. So using this term in the indication sets the framework for the indication, meaning it's, it's meaningful to most prescribers. 
based on and state the effect of the surrogate endpoint or intermediate, or intermediate clinical endpoint that support the accelerate approval um, response rate um, or whatever that endpoint is. And the inclusion of that phrase uh, conveys information about the limitations of usefulness or uncertainty about clinical benefit. So if I use the term endpoint response rate, oncologists know what the limitations of that are. Uh, for instance, doesn't include, it's not akin to survival. They understand the limitations of that endpoint. See clinical studies. This is a requirement in the regulations to include this cross-reference to clinical studies. However, the guidance states that this does not need to be included in highlights, only in the full prescribing information. And then this last statement is, continued approval for this indication may be contingent upon verification and description of clinical benefit in a confirmatory trial. This is very much regulatory text. However, it emphasizes the limitations of the study results that support the approval. Um, and again, gives some kind of meaning, again, additional meaning to the context of accelerated approval. So this is our final approved indication that we've come full circle. So drug X in combination with prednisone is indicated for treatment of adult and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older with disease A. This indication is approved under accelerated approval based on Y endpoint, with reference to clinical studies. Continued approval for this indication may be contingent upon verification description of clinical benefit in a confirmatory trial. And we have a limitation of use. Drug X is not indicated for the treatment of disease B. Hepatotoxicity that has been observed when drug X is used to treat disease B. So in summary, when trying to determine what information is pertinent to indications and usage versus other sections of labeling, the first place to turn is regulations and guidances. That will dictate, in general, where to start, at least. Um, but another very important concept to consider and remember is that labeling is a communication tool. And ultimately, the, the message we're trying to convey is also equally important in how to describe that message and labeling and where to describe it. So challenge question. Which of the following is not true? A, the indicated population is nearer the study population, i.e., population described in clinical studies. B, there may be instances where it's necessary to include information in the clinical in the indications and uses section that's discussed in greater detail elsewhere in labeling. C, in most cases, limitations of use will identify a particular patient population in which a drug should generally not be used. Or D, indications approved under accelerated approval must include a, cross, a reference to clinical studies. Anybody want to throw out an answer? Yeah, I hear A. And correct, A's answer. And I've included some references. And thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.